We have inspiration, we have perspiration. But the third and most important to me is desperation. And that is, I'm not really fit to do anything else. In terms of uh, creation, uh, whether it's uh, an inventor, an innovator, as Thomas Edison, another Jersey boy, uh, put it, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So in terms of becoming a writer, it's not something uh, necessarily you're born with. Uh, you weren't, you would like to point out, you weren't doing it in the womb. Walk us through how you uh, sort of walked into becoming a writer. It wasn't your life plan from the time you were conceived. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I, I'll, I'll take a little twist on, on Thomas Edison's. I think there's three things that make a writer, um, two of which are obvious and you mentioned, and the third is not quite as obvious, but maybe it's probably most important. So the first is inspiration. You have to be inspired to write. Well, obvious, let's just do that and move on. The second is the perspiration part of writing. And that is you have to actually write. And this is what a lot of people don't get. Writing is only one thing is writing, and that is writing. Producing words on paper or a screen is only thing that counts as writing. So for those out there, outlining is not writing, creating characters is not writing. Going to the coffee shop and talking about books to your friends is not writing. Only writing is writing. Only actually, don't give yourself an easy way out. Research is definitely not writing. None of that counts as writing. So we have inspiration, we have perspiration. But the third and most important to me is desperation. And that is, I'm not really fit to do anything else, like have a real job. Um, I'm not, I'm disorganized, I'm forgetful, I'm a little lazy minded in other things, I get distracted easily. So this is all I can do. And that desperation, that need to have something to do and be able to do this is what drives me back and making sure that I'm constantly at work and making the best story that I can. If I'm really accomplished in something else, it's a bad thing in a, in, in a way. Um, I heard a story about from two famous musicians talking and one was starting as he made a lot of money buying two or three houses. And then he started to get into like, really like antique carpets. He was going every weekend and, and doing antique carpets. And his friend realized he's not gonna make the great music anymore because he has other interests. It's a negative to have other interests. I have basically my family and my writing. I took up golf, which was dumb. But really, those are the, the two things. And so um, by being a little bit obsessive, you, you, you have to be a little bit obsessive, I think, to, 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 be, to write as many books as I have and to keep going. It has to be the only thing you're good at. And uh, it's not always clear. You uh, went to Amherst. Uh, yeah. You had a job with the family travel agency for a while. Yep. Uh, Perhaps you uh, learned a little fiction there. Uh, you were a tour guide in Spain, and yeah. you once described how at the end of the day, these people would want to say, what was that the little cathedral five miles off the road, four hours we passed by at uh, 50, 60 miles an hour? What, what was that cathedral? You had to come up with a name. Right, just make it up. <laughs> out of thin air. <laughs> just make so, it up. Uh, I, usually, I usually called it um, San Maria de la Muerza, which means St. Mary of Lunch. But uh, it <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> right. So you make the point that uh, writing is a job and don't wait for the muse. Walk us through that. That's yeah. like a plumber. You got to fix the pipes. You got to sit down and write. Even if nothing's coming out, you got to make yourself do it. It's true. In a, in, a, in a Philip Roth novel, there was a line. He was actually quoting somebody else, but uh, Philip Roth had a, had a line in a novel where he said that um, amateurs wait for the muse to arrive. The rest of us just get to work. And that's just great. Um, it may be an art, it may be something highfalutin, but the actual process is not pretty or, or easy and it, it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, you, the other comparison, I think novels a little bit like a sausage. You might like the final taste, you probably don't wanna know how it was made. Uh, and you mentioned the plumber and, and that's exactly it. I can't wake up one day and say, oh, you know, today I'm too important to, to do pipes. Plumber can't say that, and I have to treat it like the like a job. So every writer that's produced any any amount of work, and almost every great artist that I know, be they a painter, sculptor, musician, whatever it is, um, will tell you that 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 you really have to treat it like a job. It's best you can't sit there. That's what amateurs do. They kind of sit there and they think something divine is going to happen to them, and that's just not how it works. 
And uh, in terms of uh, how you do it, you once said, if you ask 10 writers how they do it, you'll get 11 different answers. Uh, but in your case, you uh, have, a, when you s sit down to do it, you have a beginning and an end. Yeah, when and I write the in novel. Between. Yeah, when I write the novel, I know the beginning when I start, obviously, at the beginning, and I know the end. Um, so I think of the idea, I think of that last twist, and then I begin the journey. I compare it to traveling from our home state of New Jersey across the country to California. I may go Route 80, which is direct route. Chances are I'll go via the Suez Canal or stop in Tokyo. But I pretty much always end up in California, and I, and I see it there from the beginning, and that kind of helps me, helps me get there. But the route I'll take, I don't know. There's a great quote, there's several great quotes on writing, of course, but one of my favorites from E.L. Doctorow, who says that writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. It's kind of what I do, except I know where that journey's gonna end. Well, this gets to uh, the proverbial writer's block, uh, which you say, so what else is new? Uh, <laughs> or you paint yourself in a corner. You. Uh, you just have to describe how you just have to bull your way through it. Yeah, you know, if you look, you write your way in a corner, you got to figure out how you're going to back out. It's like, you know, you, you parked in too tight of a space and you're trying to get out and you have to go inch by inch maybe and keep turning and twisting. But the problem with the problem is what some people start to do is they just kind of give up um, when they write that. Everybody has those moments of what we call writer's block, writing ourselves into some place that we just don't know our way out of. The question is, how do you handle it? Part of it also is something, there's something that's zen about it. I've learned that that's part of the process. So there's no reason to extra beat myself up over it. You know, I'll get out of it as long as I stick with it. If I say, oh, you know, I just, I just won't do anything, it'll come to me. Not really a good idea. Take a walk, uh, take a bike ride, do something athletic. But even when I'm doing something else, there's always a voice in my head that says I should be writing. There's always a voice trying to to figure out what that, you know, untie that knot that I left, I left behind. So the key is accept that writer's block is part of the process and understand that may, it's telling you something and often your best moments will come when you get through that, that writer's block. If it's going a little too smoothly, you know, maybe there's a problem there. So oftentimes I throw in my own writer's block where I have a scene sort of planned out how it's going to go a certain chapter and then a character acts. Um, I, I was trying to get the character to act in a way that wasn't into the character. So it changes things around. I'll give a quick example. So if you're writing a scene, I've written, I wrote this scene once in an old Myron Bolotar book where Myron was going into one of those no tell motels, you know, with the sign on the outside saying, now featuring towels, that kind of motel. <laughs> and he was going to bribe the guy behind the desk to give him some information. That was my plan. But when Myron walked in there and I'm writing it, all of a sudden, this guy behind the desk of the sleazy motel actually has it beautifully set up and he's wearing tails and he takes his job really seriously and he won't accept the bribe. So how does Myron get out of that? How does he figure it out now? He can't just give the guy the easy answer, the $50 and move on. And that created all kinds of comic possibilities and may and forced Myron to be clever and more original, and the scene ends up not being the same scene you've seen 800 times before. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the writing process, it's good uh, for people to hear that many times what you think you've done sucks. I mean, you think, this is crap. It, it, it happens all the time. W walk us through that so uh, we don't get discouraged in the <laughs> job if we think, oh boy, this is not working out so well. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much every day. Um, I, 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 act, I actually think the, the probably the biggest difference between someone who's actually writing and someone who wants to write who doesn't. There's a million differences, but the biggest difference is the ability to turn off that voice in your head or at least ignore it. We all have it. Um, I know Stephen King still has it, where you're writing and you read something and you go, wow, you know, imposter syndrome, this really stinks, I'm no good. The writer who tells you that they don't feel that way is usually a terrible writer. Only bad writers think they're good. Uh, only if you talk and a writer go, oh, you know, this is a real masterpiece and I have no trip. No, trust me, that book stinks. The rest of us have to kind of go through this, you sort of live with this natural insecurity. The key is to understand as part of the process. So all the things that slow you down, and I still go through, 
on my 33rd or 34th book, whatever I'm on now. Um, I just know, I recognize that it's not going to, it's not really the end of the world. My wife, I, I'll often whine to my wife. I was, you know, oh, this book's not working at all. And she just rolls her eyes because she said, you said that every book, you know. Um, and that's just part of the process. The key is to turn off that voice that paralyzes you. And we all have it. To turn that off or to fight through it and get through it. Um, pardon my language on this. Uh, the great um, Anne Lamott has a book called Bird by Bird, which I highly recommend. It's the greatest writing guide in the world. And she has something called the shitty first draft. It's a chapter which basically gives you permission, don't, which I, I do tell everybody, just, just throw it down, just throw, just throw it up, if you will. Don't worry if it stinks, don't worry if you have the wrong word, don't worry if the dialogue, instead, just throw it all up and then fix it. The comparison I often do is, is diamond mining, which is not something I know much about, but if you know anything about diamond mining, they, they take this big, ugly rock out of the ground and you look at that rock and it's big and ugly and nothing there, but that's where the value is. That's what's worth a fortune. Then later on, they will char polish it down and chop it up and do all the things they do to make it something beautiful that you want to wear. That's what your rewrites are supposed to do. The key is to get that ugly stone, that's where all the value is, out of the ground first. Mm -hmm.